What's up, everyone? Welcome into Dodger Heads, presented by DodgerBlue.com. Your home for the 2020 World Series champion, LA Dodgers, and they've got big, fat, shiny rings to prove it. That's Daniel Starkin. I'm Jeff Spiegel. We do not have rings. And as far as I know, I'll speak for myself, Daniel. I do not have the 35K it's going to take to buy a ring as a season ticket holder. I mean, I don't know how things are going for you. Lakers side of things, maybe 35K for a ring for you. <laughs> I don't know about a ring, but one thing I do want, I definitely want one of those uh, gold jerseys or the the white jerseys with the gold. Um, I, try, I tried to get a Seager one. Uh, they were you know, out of XLs right now, but, but hopefully they get some in stock real soon. Cause those things are sweet, but yeah, the rings are insane. I mean, I didn't expect anything less out of the Dodgers, yeah. but like, even with my high expectations, they did not disappoint. Totally. And I'm with you on the jerseys. I think they're amazing. I pulled the trigger on a Mookie Betts Jersey and I, it's like one of those things where it's like, I don't even wear it. Like I, I live in Oregon. So the number of games I get to go to is yeah. less than I would like it to be. And a baseball Jersey is not the type of thing that I just casually wear around on a Saturday. Yeah, so you. <laughs> I pulled the trigger on it. I'm not entirely sure whether I'll come to regret that decision just because of the money. But yeah, they sold out quickly. And I'll be curious to see if they actually do produce more or if this was just kind of yeah. a limited run thing. Because I was looking on Friday afternoon. And like you said, Seeger was sold out. Bueller was sold out. Uh, Mookie, surprisingly, had the most options. And then Bellinger uh, and Kershaw. Kershaw was sold out as well. So anyway, sweet jerseys. I was debating jersey or hat. Ended up going with the Mookie jersey. So uh, I don't think I'll come to regret that decision. But uh, it's been a good week for the Dodgers. I want the record to show that since Daniel and I recorded our first show of the the season, I believe the Dodgers are eight and one. So uh, yep. of course they're eight and two overall. So it's not like we're necessarily dramatically helping things, but uh, it, it's been a great start to the season. Sim simply put, uh, we got a fun one for you tonight. We're going to talk Clayton Kershaw's resurgence. We had some questions a week ago. Small sample size. Things have turned around for him. We may have a closer controversy on our hands. Kenley Jansen and Corey Knable. We'll talk Dustin May, who, who was scheduled to start over the weekend, got bumped a little bit, but he had a fantastic first start. And then we'll get into our normal uh, stuff of stock up and stock down, big deal and no deal. And then at the end, we're going to do some intro video power rankings here. So if you follow me on Twitter, you saw mine already. We'll, uh, we'll see if Daniel agrees with mine. But let's start with <laughs> the headline. And that's the thing that every Dodger fan is probably taking a sigh of relief on. And that is Clayton Kershaw having a bit of a resurgence. We know he struggled in the spring. He had a rough opening day start, five and two thirds, 10 hits, five earned, one walk, two strikeouts, only six swinging strikes. That's in Coors Field. But it was one of those things where I don't think either of us were panicked. It was the only game we had in front of us. So, of course, on a Dodger show, we're going to talk about, hey, he's yeah. getting a little bit older. Is this the thing? He bounces back the last two starts. Uh, first against the A's, seven innings pitched, four hits, one earned, no walks, eight strikeouts, with an astonishing 21 swinging strikes against the A's. His third start today against Max Scherzer in the Nationals, six innings, five hits, no earned, no walks, six strikeouts, 12 swinging strikes. So has Kershaw answered any questions or even the smallest, tiniest th shred of doubt that may have crept into your mind after a terrible spring and a terrible opening day start? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think he has. Like you just mentioned, we weren't sitting here panicking or anything, but a week ago we were definitely talking about, like, are we worried about Kershaw? And we were a little worried. I yeah. mean, he had a horrible spring. I'm not going to sugarcoat that, yeah. which it's just spring, so so what? But he came out in his first outing, and he, he wasn't at his best, anywhere close to his best. So we, we were a little worried, but I, I'd say he's put an end to all those worries. Yeah. Just one week later, he's had two great outings. Um, you mentioned the, the swinging strikes, and, and to me, that's the biggest thing. Like, that's when Kershaw's at his best, when he's got that slider working. He's got he's dropping the curveball in there, and, and and hitters just don't know what's coming, yeah. and, and they swing right over it. Um, so so I'm, and I don't think he had as many swinging strikes today, but he still had a decent amount. And the Nats, you know, that's, that's a pretty good team, and, and he made it look kind of easy out there. So, yeah, I think we could put all – all concerns about Kershaw to bed. Uh, he's looking great, and and so is the rest of this team. To be quite honest, I mean eight and two, that's the best record in baseball right now. And and when you look, they're missing two MVPs yeah. at the moment. Like Bellinger and Mookie are both hurt, and and they haven't skipped a beat. And even when you look at the two losses, like right. weird things <laughs> had to happen for them to lose those games. Like they're. Uh, a historic, you know, uh, bad, a historically bad performance with runners in scoring position and, and a blown save away from being 10 and 0. So, yeah, all, all's good right now. Kershaw looks great and the Dodgers look great. Well, I was looking, I mean, this stat blew me away. Maybe you've seen it. Jake DeGrom is obviously the ace of the, the league. He's fantastic. He throws 100 miles yeah. an hour. Maybe you've seen this stat. Do you know the age difference between Jacob DeGrom and Clayton Kershaw? 
I, I'm pretty sure they're, it's pretty similar, right? Three months apart. I mean, you, it's just yeah. crazy because you think of DeGrom and most people, yeah, he's a late if you just pull yeah. them, they'd guess he's, you know, late twenties. He's three yeah. months younger than Clayton Kershaw. So, and that's, again, yeah. there's a ton of mileage on Kershaw's arm. You know, somebody, there was some stat that I saw number of starts with, uh, seven innings plus with zero or one earned run. And it was like this DeGrom thing. He had like 70 something. And it's like, oh yeah, Kershaw has like 130 of those. So it's yeah. just crazy to think. So obviously DeGrom's arm is a lot fresher than Kershaw's. But when you think about DeGrom, it kind of puts in perspective that we're not necessarily having to put Kershaw out to pasture here just because he's getting up there in age. He's not Rich Hill old. Okay. He's, he's Clayton Kershaw old and He's still, you know, last year, two point something ERA. He was fantastic. And the last two starts, again, have eased all concerns. The biggest thing for me, 14 strikeouts, no walks. Unbelievable. That's exactly what you look for. And this is one of the things I like about kind of the direction that baseball is going is that as fans, I think we can become more educated about what to look for. And so swinging strikes is not something that was in my vocabulary two or three years ago, but it is now. And it's kind of, it is such a helpful measurement. We're going to talk more about it when we get to Dustin May, but it's a helpful measurement because it tells you exactly what you want to see. Obviously caught looking, those are helpful as well, but to, to, for a guy to, to see a ball, think he can hit it and swing and miss, that's a measure of how dominant or nasty a guy is. And so for Kershaw to have 33 of those in thir- 13 innings, his last two starts, the Nationals, as you said, a really good lineup. Uh, the Oakland A's, not terrible. I mean, the Rockies, you can write off. That was in Coors. But um, yeah, I'm not here to say that like Clayton Kershaw is the best starting pitcher that the Dodgers have or the best starting pitcher in the league, which I am going to ask you in a moment to give me your rankings of the Dodgers starting pitching because that's a fun conversation, but I'm with you. I guess I'll phrase one last question to you on this front. What do you look for in Kershaw? I mean, it's not velocity, right? Like we're beyond the days where we're like, oh, if Kershaw's touching 96 with his fastball, yeah. then we're good. Like for me, it's, it's the strikeout to walk ratio. It's the swinging strikes. I'm not really worried about that kind of thing. Is it movement? Like what, what's your sort of metric that you use, whether it's a number or not a number, to measure Clayton Kershaw, to evaluate Clayton Kershaw yourself? Yeah, I, it's definitely a variety of things. I mean, he's such a great pitcher that even when he's not at his best, you know, he still finds a way to get outs. Um, you mentioned the velocity. I'm with you. I don't really look at velocity a whole lot, although I will say his velocity was uh, up today a little bit. He was hitting 92 uh, pretty consistently, which is always a good sign yeah. for, for a guy getting older. But uh, to me, I'm I'm more looking at maybe the the velocity difference between his fastball and slider. Yeah. I think sometimes when he he's got himself into trouble is when those are too similar. Like he's throwing a fastball at 89 and then yeah. a slider at 87, and like that's just not much of a difference. That's not going to get the hitter off balance or anything. So to me, if he's if he's sitting with the fastball 91, 92, and the slider is you know 85, 86, even 87, like that's a big enough difference that he's going to get the swing and misses that he has gotten. Um, and, and another thing for me is I look at the walks, like yeah. how's he controlling his pitches? That's always a big thing. He's throughout the course of his career. Yeah. He's rarely ever walks anyone and, and he, he's off to a good start again. The last you mentioned the last couple starts, he hasn't walked anyone. So that's always a good sign. Um, but yeah, I mean, if overall, he's looked really good his last couple times out. He was he wasn't really in any like jams yeah. um, today at all. Like he, he he gave up a couple hits here and there, but no balls that were you know crushed by any means. Um, and he got Juan Soto out every time, wow. or or maybe every time but one. But I thought that was pretty cool considering what happened the last time he faced him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Kershaw looks great, and I mean now I think he's pitching with you know less pressure than usual. Not only because they won the World Series, but also just because of how good this rotation is. Like yeah. they got so many guys that he doesn't have to go out there and be B guy every time. He's just got to be A guy, and you know he's been great so far. Yeah, and I think the slider is a big one. I mean that seems to be the pitch that kind of can make him elite. I mean you see some of the pitching ninja stuff when his slider is on and it's just disappearing. Um, that feels like it's the pitch to kind of keep an eye on. Um, obviously whether his command is what it is, can he get swinging strikes, but those are some big ones. So let's shift gears to another guy in the rotation before we go to the closer. Let's talk Dustin May. Dustin May has made just one start so far this season. Again, I believe he was scheduled to start today, but they moved Kershaw up on regular rest and pushed May back, which we'll talk about maybe per chance why they made that decision. But (laughs) Dustin May has had one start, six innings, two hits, two walks, eight strikeouts, no earned runs. And the biggest thing that you and I talked about, we talked about right before he made his first start and said, the thing we are watching for is, can he miss bats? We know this stuff looks nasty, but can he actually use the four-seamer to offset the two-seamer, cutter, slider, breaking ball, whatever? Can he do it? The answer was yes, 16 swinging strikes. And 
I threw this number out in, in one of the short videos we posted right after he made that start. Last season, there were 81 pitchers in baseball who threw 50 or more innings. Dustin May's whiff rate was 74th out of 81. 74th out of 81. He's down by Rick Porcello and Marco Gonzalez, okay? <laughs> That's where his whiff rate was, despite the fact that he throws a 101-mile-an-hour two-seamer that moves like four inches to the right. This, yeah. in his first appearance, of the 44 pitches that were swung at, 16 of them were missed, good for a 36% whiff rate, which is nearly double his rate last year and would have placed him fourth in all of baseball. I'm not saying his whiff rate is going to stay there, but kind of what I suggested in the video is that even if he gets halfway between last year and where he was, he's going to be a top 25, 30 pitcher right around Clayton Kershaw, Zach Greinke, Jose Barrios, those types of guys when it comes to whiff rate. So it's one start. People didn't want us to overreact to one bad Kershaw start. We probably shouldn't overreact to one good Dustin yeah. May start. But all that said, all the caveats aside, this was everything we wanted from a Dustin May start. Yeah, and, and you mentioned it's only one start, but it's really been kind of a trend all spring. Like yeah. we've seen him striking out more guys all spring. So it's it's he's definitely changed up some things. Like it's he he's still got the same you know, pitches the same stuff he had last year. Like, it's not like he wasn't filthy last right. year. Like, he's, he was still throwing 101 and and whatever. He just wasn't getting swing and misses. And and I think we've seen, you know, the changes he's made. You mentioned the forcing fastball. He's thrown that a lot more. He's thrown it up in the zone, which is something we didn't really see him do at all yeah. last year. And and I think with the – even though he throws, you know, the two-seamer at 100 miles an hour, like, that's a pitch that's designed to get ground balls, not necessarily swing and misses. So we see him going to the forcing – the high forcing – more, which that opens up his other pitches. Um, we mentioned, you know, the need to develop a third pitch, a breaking ball. Uh, he's still not thrown that a ton. I haven't looked at the data, but he threw, he mixed it in a little bit, which keeps guys on their toes. And and what we saw, the really dominant pitch he had in his first start was his cutter, which is, that's, I mean, that's the off-speed pitch he's been throwing yeah. and, and has had a lot of success with. So, you know, I think that the, the addition of the high four seam just, you know, opens up so many possibilities for him. And yeah, I mean, he was everything we'd hoped he'd be in that first start. Um, you mentioned he got pushed back a little bit. So, so we'll see him on, you know, extra rest on Wednesday or whenever he's pitching. I'm not exactly sure, but um, yeah, he, he looked great. We, we know what his ceiling is. It's just a matter of, can he get there or not? And, and that's my follow-up to all of that. How sustainable is what we saw? We're obviously zero earned runs is not sustainable last year he yeah. had an era under three do you think i mean are you what confidence level would you give that dustin may can put an era under three together over a full season you know obviously he's not going to throw 200 innings this year but right. let's say he makes 28 starts averages about five innings per under three era how confident are you he could put that together I think it's entirely possible. I mean, we saw him put up a, a 2.5 ERA last year, and that was without missing bats. Yeah. Like, now you add in uh, the ability to strike a guy out when you need it, and I think that's going to help him a lot. Like, you see, sometimes you're in a jam, you know, t runners on second and third, one out. A ground ball isn't going to cut it there if you're trying to, you know, avoid the run scoring, yeah. obviously. Like, sometimes you just need a strikeout, and now he has the ability to go get it. So, uh, I don't know if he's going to have an ERA under three. Like, we ha we haven't seen him pitch a full 162-game season. We've only seen yeah. bits and pieces. So, I guess we'll see what happens. But I, I think he's definitely capable of doing it. Um, you know, we saw in his first start how, how filthy he is. Yeah. Um, that's not going to change yeah. <laughs> at all. So as long as he could stay healthy, I'm expecting a big year from him. Well, and it's worth noting too, you know, we're going to talk about some of this, but Gonsolin's on the IL. Jimmy Nelson has not looked great. David Price has not looked great. And so you kind of thought, oh, they're going to rotate a bunch of these guys in. Still very likely yeah. that happens. But I think there is this sense that maybe Dustin May has a lot firmer grip on every fifth day on, on his side. So with that in mind, it's kind of an exercise that, that a friend posed to me. I'm curious to hear for you. If you had to rank Dodgers starting pitchers right now, if we're overreacting, being prisoners of the moment, what we've seen so far. Yeah. And I'm not talking about big game pitchers where it's like, well, obviously give me, you know, Tr Walker Bueller because he's a big game pitcher. I'm not talking that, I, you know, yeah. however you want to judge it. But between the guys they have, so Clayton Kershaw, Walker Bueller, Urias, Bauer, if you want to include Nelson, Gonsolin, et cetera, assuming those guys were healthy. Um I mean, are you are you overreacting? Is Dustin May in the top three of that conversation now? Where, how would you rank those guys uh, for yourself? And then I'll share mine after. Yeah, 
I, I mean, it's hard to rank them yeah. just because they're all so freaking good. Like, yeah. and they've all looked great to start the year too. Like, it's not like one guy's come out like, oh, you know, he's right. he's maybe taking a step back or anything. But no, they've all looked great so far. So it's it's really hard to rank them. Um, with that said, I'm still going Bueller number one. Um, I know you said not to you know, take into account the big game thing, but I just can't ignore that. Yeah. Like that's still, that's still, if I, if I have a, if I need a guy to take the mound, it's still Bueller. And, and we've, you know, from what we've seen from him this year, he's, he came into camp, you know, ready to go. He, from all, everything he said, he wants to have a big regular season as well. In addition to the postseason. he's healthy. You know, he's looked good. His first two starts, he's two and oh, I believe. Yeah. Um, so I'm going Walker Bueller one. I still think he's got a Cy Young or two in him, you know, at some point in the near future. Um, after that, I'm going to go Trevor Bauer uh, just because of the, you know, he's a workhorse. The guy's going to, he's going to lead this team in innings. He's going to pitch. We we saw him throw 116 pitches or whatever it was in his last start. You're not seeing any other starter on the staff <laughs> yeah. get anywhere close to that. Um, and his strikeout numbers, um, you know, his strikeout numbers are great so far to start the season. We'll see what comes of this, you know, sticky ball situation. I, I personally don't think anything's going to come of it, so I'm not too worried. But um, he's looked great. So I'd, I'd have him number two. And right behind him, I'd, I'd have Kershaw um, for all the reasons, you know, we just talked about. I'm not going to go too, too deep into that. Um, after that, I'm going Julio. Okay. Um, he's still... He's still Julio. Like we we saw what he did, you know, in October last year. He, he's come out this year. He had a he out of the Dodgers four guys that pitched at Coors Field. He had the best outing of I them thought, all. Yeah. Um, he he was awesome. Um, you know, he gave up a couple runs last night, but you know that was no harm, no foul. They they won that game pretty easily. Um, I still got Dustin May in the five spot. Um, I got to see more of it. That's the main reason. Um, he looked great in his first start, but. At the end of the day, that's only one start. That's not enough to get ahead of the, the other four guys that have accomplished so much. Um, so I guess that's kind of the same as I would have had it before the season started. Um, so not much has changed, and that's basically just because they've all looked so great so far. Do you have a gap? How big is the gap between three and four? I feel like that's if there's going to be sort of a, a break in tiers, maybe yeah, I, one I, through three to group together, kind of mix up the order there, and then four and five, same thing. Yeah, I, I'm not going to say it's a huge gap because, you know, Julio and May have both been so great. But but with that being said, I'd say if there was a gap, I'd put it there. Like, yeah. I still think the Dodgers' top three guys are legit aces yeah. on basically any staff in baseball. Like, they're, they're game one starters on any other team other than the Dodgers. It's pretty crazy to think about that one of those guys is going to be starting game three of a postseason yeah. series. Um, that's insane. But, yeah, I'd say those those three guys are, are legit aces. Julio, I... I put him as like a number two or number three starter um, and Dustin may the same with him. So yeah, I'd say the gap is after number three. Yeah. I mean, for me, I, I've got Bauer one. I know the ERA is not pretty with him, but I mean, you think about game one, he took a no hitter in Coors into the sixth or seventh inning. Yeah. He's striking out almost 14 guys per nine innings. <laughs> um, he's been dominant. He's been everything the Dodgers had hoped for. Obviously you hope that ERA comes down a tick um, 4.15 so far this season, but I've got him one. Uh, I think Bueller and Kershaw are really close in my estimation. Again, um, you know, like you said, it's hard to take out the big game stuff, but I do think people forget that Bueller's regular season numbers have been very good, yeah. but not elite. Uh, whereas Kershaw's have pretty much remained really, really good. So I think you could argue that Kershaw's number two on that list. Maybe I give him a slight nod just because of how we've seen him pitch the last couple of outings obviously Bueller's looked good and doesn't have the blemish so I think those guys are really close you could put them tied basically for number two just a tick yeah. behind Bauer and then I'm with you I think Urias and May are really really close um, I'd probably lean May just because if we're projecting a little bit and you know that's part of what I'm doing I'm not saying anybody else has to but if his swinging strike rate gets up into the 25th to 35th in all of baseball rather than 74th out of 81 Watch out. I mean, like you said, he was putting guys on, inducing such weak contact that he still had an ERA that low. And so I think just the ceiling with him is really, really high. And then, yeah, Julio Urias is your fifth starter. This is a guy with, you know, a <laughs> sub three ERA so far. Uh, so there's no complaints. And again, I'm the guy that actually think Tony Gonsolin probably belongs in the same tier as Urias and May if he's healthy. That's how yeah. high on Gonsolin I am. Healthy, yeah. We've been disappointed by Price and Nelson so far. Um, but we'll see how that develops. Obviously, Gonson on the IL. So I'm with you. I think I think there's one through three, mix up the order. You could put it any three you want. Four and five, mix up the order, any order you want. But 
it's it's absolutely insane. And that's what I said when I recorded the short on uh, Monday or Tuesday was if you want the the easiest thing to point to to prove how insane the Dodger roster is, go look at their number five starter. I mean, that's the difference <laughs> between the Dodgers and every other team in a nutshell. The Dodgers number five starter is probably one of the 50 best pitchers in all of baseball. No yep. questions asked. No questions asked. And if you think about it, when I say the top 50, that means every team gets two. That's 60. So the Dodgers have yeah. five of the top 50. It's absolutely ridiculous how good the Dodgers have been. Yeah, it's been insane. And real quick, you mentioned, you know, kind of disappointing about Price and Nelson. I just want to say we got to give those totally. guys some time. Like neither neither of them threw a single inning last season. And also neither of them have thrown out of the bullpen like ever pretty much. Like so it's going to take those guys some time to get adjusted to their roles. Um, so I'm not worried about those guys. Uh, they're, they're, they're just getting back into the swing of things. But yeah, I mean, the, the starting the Dodgers starting rotation is just insane. I tweeted the other day. Um, it's honestly like it's it's pretty cool knowing like no matter who's starting like that night like i'm looking forward to watching them totally. you know like there's been times in the past where it's like oh like scott casimir's on the mound today or like oh brett anderson like no nah. but with these guys i'm legitimately looking forward to yeah. watching every single one of them which is just so cool we didn't get the patented daniel no offense to scott casimir but <laughs> but i'm not excited no to watch no any no scott offense. casimir starts <laughs> <laughs> well, let's switch gears a little bit from starting pitching to relief pitching. And this is, I think, one of the most fascinating storylines story in Dodger land right now. And, and I think today on Sunday, we're recording this on Sunday night after their, their uh, game three against the Nationals. It's clear that things have shifted yet again in this conversation. Obviously, we're always reacting to small sample size with relief pitchers. It's the same. But the question I'm asking is, who is the closer for the Dodgers? They have two guys who have two saves apiece, I believe, uh, in, in Corey Knable and Kenley Jansen. And going into today's game, Corey Knable had saved the last one um, and has been dominant. Corey Knable in five appearances, four and a third innings. No hits, <laughs> no earned runs, one walk, six strikeouts. Uh, he did get two saves. Uh, the first save came the day after Jansen pitched. So that was an easy explanation there. Jansen pitched on April 3rd. Knable got the save on April 4th. Knable then got a save on April 9th, which the ex the explanation given, I almost said excuse, we'll stick with the word explanation given, <laughs> was that Jansen had pitched on both the 6th and the 7th, and something about they don't want him pitching three, three times in four days, I believe was the explanation. And so even though he had yeah. had a day off on the 8th, they held him out on the 9th. Knable's been unbelievable. Like, we're not just talking about Jansen side of things. Knable, four and a third, five appearances, no hits allowed, okay? Now, Kenley Jansen, after today's dominant performance has four appearances 4.2 innings only one earned run only one hit the difference being four walks and three strikeouts uh but that on the surface says well this is easy Corey Knables your closer today Kenley Jansen touching 93 and 94 excuse me touching 95 sitting 93 94 uh Justin Lorber mentioned that there was an alignment change possibly that the Dodgers were working on he also apparently gained 300 rotations per minute on his cutter so I'll, I'll go with this question. This is from Kevin Blue Goon 82 on Twitter. Should we be optimistic about Jansen after today or will we be tricked like we have before? Should we be optimistic about Jansen and is he the closer for the Dodgers right now? I mean, it's hard. It's hard not to be optimistic after watching what we watched today. Like that was as dominant as we've seen him in years, mm -hmm. I, I must say. Um, you know, the cutter was moving. Like you said, the velocity was as high as it's been in a while. Um, so it's hard not to be optimistic. But at the same time, I got to see him do it more. Yeah. Like he's his first outing of the season in Colorado. He came in and got a five out yeah. save. No issues, no nothing. It's like, oh, Kenley's great. Kenley's the closer. And then he comes back, you know, the next outing and, and blows it or yeah. the outing after or the third one, like whatever it is, you know, we got to see it consistent. Yeah. Um, with that being said, I, I think um, this is kind of going to be a situation where it's not who's the closer one guy. Like, you know, I, I think we're going to see multiple guys getting saves as we've seen. Dave Roberts straight up said the other day that he's comfortable with four guys in the ninth inning getting saves. Um, and that's Kenley, Knable, the two guys you mentioned, and then also Blake Trinan and Victor Gonzalez. Yeah. So there's no shortage of options there. We got Bruce Dark Gratterall's coming back probably in the next couple weeks yeah. here. Um, so I think, I, I will say, I think Kenley is still, you know, number one on the list. And I think uh, 
save opportunities that are going to kind of work around his schedule. Like like you said, Knable only got that that save opportunity in the home opener because Kenley had pitched in two straight games yeah. and with only one off day. They didn't want to do a three and four. So I think if Kenley Jansen hasn't pitched a lot, it's, it's going to be him. Um, but, I mean, with that said, if he pitches one night, that means he's probably not going to pitch the next night. Or if he pitches, you know, two nights, he's definitely not the third and fourth. Yeah. So I, I think there's going to be plenty of opportunities out there. And it's – I mean, we don't need to talk about postseason right now, but um, I think, you know, the way Corey Knables looked, you know, if the postseason was starting today, then then I think he's the guy. His his curveball is just nasty. I mean, the, the Nationals the other yeah, day just watching it. had no chance with that. <laughs> had absolutely no chance with that thing. And then, then when you account for he's got, you know, 97, 98 as well, like you can't just sit on that curveball. Yeah. So, yeah, he's looked he's looked incredible. I mean, we had high hopes for him just yeah. because of what he's done in the past, but he's been even better than we had hoped so far. Um, but yeah, I, I think this is going to be a conversation we're having all season. I think Kenley's going to have his ups and downs. One thing we've, we've seen with Kenley basically the last few years is even though he struggled at times, he's never been bad enough yeah. to fully give up the role. Like every time he has a bad outing, he's going to come back and give you two or three good ones in a row. And then you start, you know, getting optimistic like that, that the guy who asked the question, you know, was saying, is he tricking us or should we actually, you know, actually be optimistic? I, I don't really know. We'll see. Yeah. But I mean, I, I was pleased with what I saw today. So we'll, you know, we'll see what we get from him next time. out. Yeah. I mean, everyone wants to make a big deal. He blew a save. Yes. I, his ERA is sub two for the season, you know, obviously small sample size, but in, in four appearances, he has allowed one run which in the grand scheme of being a closer, I mean, that essentially works its way out to about an ERA of 2, 2.25, something like that. So yeah, you exactly. have to put things in perspective. <laughs> like a closer who gives up a run is put in such a dramatically different perspective than the seventh inning guy who gives up a run or whatever, especially if it's a one-run game and not a right. three-run game. The thing with Jansen is the walks. I mean, four appearances, four walks is unacceptable. Last year, I talked about how yeah. great his exit velocity was. He's only given up one hit so far this season. The problem is, if you give up weak contact but are walking guys, the weak contact doesn't play up as much as you would hope it to. Because exactly what happened, right? He walks two guys, and then he gives up some weak contact, and they just knock guys around and score the run. So it's not like he got roughed up. Yep. He just couldn't throw strikes. So that's the thing. I mean, Knable was funny watching him throw all those curveballs. It was reminiscent in a good way of, what was it, Lance McCullers against the, the Dodgers where he just came out and threw yeah. curveball, 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 like 25 or 26 in yeah. a row. and. The Dodgers had no chance. It's nice to have that guy on our team, uh, Knable, <laughs> yeah. doing the same thing. So I'm with you. I mean, it's hard to argue that Knable isn't the best relief pitcher the Dodgers have. Again, very small sample size, four innings apiece. So, but I've been high on Jansen. There's nothing I've seen this year that, that has taken me off of that train. We just got to be careful with the walks. Uh, you know, and especially, I mean, if he, if he can regularly be back in that 93-94 and that RPM boost is real, then watch out. Because if, if we get 75% yeah. of the time, if we get the Jansen we saw today, I mean, that was 2016 Kenley Jansen. You know, dialing back the yeah. clock, the cutter was, I mean, insane. It's like starts an inch off the plate and ends four inches off the plate. So those guys had yeah. no chance. So I'm with you there. Uh, fascinating. And I think you nailed it. Jansen is the Dodgers closer. The only time Knable has come in are on days when Jansen was unavailable. Uh, based on how good he's pitched, I think well he's pitched. I think that is making things more interesting. Uh, I mean, you can't argue with five yeah. appearances, no hit. So uh, we'll see how that one plays yeah. out. But I, I do think the Dodgers are going to win so many games and they're going to aim to rest these guys so much that I just don't think this is going to be exactly. controversial. I think there's going to be a lot of save no. opportunities to go around. Yeah, I think it's going to be more of a conversation for the fans to have just because of, you know, what we've been through with Kenley to this point. Then I don't think it's going to be any sort of issue in the actual clubhouse with the Dodgers. Yeah. Like, sure, Kenley might blow one here or there. But as we've seen already, like he blew one. Everyone was super frustrated. And here we are at the end of the week. The Dodgers are eight and two with the best record in baseball. Yeah. So, yeah, at the end of the day, it's not going to matter a whole lot. But it's definitely uh, it can get stressful at times when Kenley's on the mound. So I, I see where some of the fans are coming from, for sure. This, this next segment is called Stock Up, Stock Down. I almost wonder if we should call this the Kenley Jansen Experience segment. Like, and we'll just which part of the roller coaster are we on yeah, with people? Right. Like, is, is this the upswing or the downswing of the roller coaster? But this is a segment we do each week just to, to look back and say, who are some guys that are trending up? Who are some guys that are trending down? I'll start with probably the most obvious one, and that's Zach McKinstry. 
Uh, today on Sunday, he has all three RBIs. He hits his second home run of the season. This one actually left the park. Uh, he also added a double, which is probably, he hit it well, probably a gift. Uh, yeah. Robles ran in, ran back, lost it in the sun. Ball drops right at the foot of the wall. So a little bit fortunate there. But this is a guy who's hitting 321 with a 355 on base, a slugging percentage of 679 so far. Two home runs, 10 RBIs, five runs scored. He's played right field. He's played second base. He played all over the place. So stock up for him. And I said, I think anybody who was weeping at Kike Hernandez having left, I think McKinstry is going to be a better version of him. So far, that's playing out, especially offensively, um, at least. But, I mean, great week for Zach McKinstry. Yeah, I mean, McKinstry's been awesome. Um, we, we we knew, you know, he was going to be a good hitter. You said all offseason, like, if, if McKinstry – He's anything. He's an offensive upgrade yeah. over Kike and at least more consistent. Something that I've kind of been surprised by is he's been really good on defense, too. Yeah. And he's been playing, you know, everywhere. everywhere. So he's been Kike in that regard, too. Like he's played second base. He's played right field. He's making plays up against the wall. <laughs> um, you know, he, he's moved over to left field today and yeah. was fine out there. So, yeah, he's been, you know, everything the Dodgers had hoped for and more, which has been huge. You know, there's they two MVP. He's out of the lineup right now, so you need someone else to come in and fill in. And it's pretty cool when, you know, essentially, you know, the 25th or 26th guy in the roster could come in and, and you don't skip a single beat. So, yeah, McKintree's been awesome. And he's already a fan favorite, which I think is really cool. Like, if, if Dodger things have show you, shown you anything, like, if you come up and perform, they'll absolutely love you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So that's my first stock up. You've got another stock up. Who's your Who's your stock up? Yeah, I just wanted to note Justin Turner just because he's off to, you know, such a hot start at the plate which is something we have yeah. ha you know not really accustomed to seeing from him he's usually he's a notorious slow starter especially when it comes to power I think coming into this season he had like literally one <laughs> career home run in the month of April he's already got two Love um it. And, and he's just crushing the ball. So um, we had some concerns given his age, you know, when they were talking about, yeah. should they resign him? Should they not? We had some concerns. Um, you know, he wasn't really catching up to, you know, high velocity <laughs> last season. But I think at this point we could kind of similar to Kershaw, we could kind of put an end to those concerns. Um, there's still some concerns defensively, I'd say. Like he's made, you know, a few few uh, bad plays. You know, his, his throws aren't always on target, but it's all right. Um a long season and he's just absolutely crushing the ball right now yeah great to see great to see uh, as you said I think there were some concerns where he's at but he hits the uh, home opener home run which is a big deal for him which is exciting so good for him uh, I'll go another this is kind of a pairing of stock up and stock down uh, Luke Rayleigh stock up DJ Peters maybe a little bit stock down uh, with yeah, Cody Bellinger headed to the injured list uh, D Luke Rayleigh was the guy that they chose the outfielder they chose to take his spot on the roster Rayleigh was a Dodger, then was on Minnesota, came back from Minnesota as part of the Kenta Maeda, Bruce Dark Gratterall trade. This is a guy who, um, you know, OPS of about 8, 880 in 33 games at AAA back in 2019. Um, solid player, a little bit older on the prospect scale. You know, not a guy that anybody's necessarily expecting to make a difference. But <coughs> I was surprised just because Peters was a guy who had made such an impression, it seemed like, at spring training, he started off really hot, kind of tapered off. But there was all this buzz, hey, this is the year he gets called up. Well, when Bellinger went down, I was like, Peters is the natural replacement because he actually plays center field. So the fact that it wasn't Peters was yeah. a bit surprising to me. Obviously, good for Rayleigh. He, he had a plate appearance um, today, I believe. Maybe it was yesterday, uh, 0 for 1. <laughs> so um, <laughs> not, not anything for him, but, I mean, it's just interesting to see kind of the pecking order. Uh, obviously, if, yeah. if Peters doesn't come up to replace the center fielder in Bellinger, then he's probably not going to come up to replace a left fielder or a right fielder. So nothing major there, just a little surprising to me. Yeah, yeah and Bellinger is probably going to be back in like a week. So like you said, it's not a huge deal. But yeah, that was something I was definitely a little surprised by. Um, I thought it would be Peters. Um, just like you said, he's a center fielder. And I don't think Rayleigh might be able to play center field in like a pinch, but he's more of a corner guy. Yeah. He's also a left-handed bat, which the Dodgers – have a lot of left-handed bats <laughs> yeah. on their bench. So I thought maybe they'd want to get another righty in there, but yeah, they, they went with Rayleigh. Um, like you said, it's not going to end up, you know, being a huge deal. I doubt he even starts the game. Like he's, you said, he's gotten one at bat. Maybe he gets like two more before yeah. being sent back down. But yeah, it was definitely interesting. Okay. Any, any other stock up, stock down guys for you? Um, I had one, one more stock down, which I'm sure you'll agree with this on based on your tweets. Um, but stock down is, is Matt Beatty. Um, 
and and it's mainly just because he hasn't really played. Yeah. Like you see how many you see how many injuries the Dodgers are dealing with in their outfield. They're they're really shorthanded right now, and he still hasn't started. I don't think he started a yeah, single game not. this season. Um, you know, we, we came you know during spring training, it, it started to seem like the main reason he was being included on the roster was because he was you know the backup right fielder <laughs> to Mookie Betts. Um, and now Mookie's been out what like four games, four yeah. or five games now, and and he hasn't Plus gotten a single day. start out there. Right. Yeah. Plus an off day. And, and I also think, um, you know, in the pinch hit appearances, Matt Beatty's gotten, he hasn't really had much success. I'm pretty sure he's 0 for seven with four strikeouts, um, which is just, I mean, it's a small sample size, of course, but that's not, not getting the job done. So I'll be curious to see how much longer Matt Beatty stays on this roster. Um, we talked in the offseason, maybe they could find a trade where he could go somewhere because, I mean, there's so many other rosters where he could make an impact on. I just don't think the Dodgers are one of them. Yeah, the right field thing is the red flag for me. It's like, oh, he's our backup right fielder. That's why he's here. Well, guess what? Mookie has started in right field. Chris Taylor has started in right field. And now Zach McKinstry has started in right yeah. field. Matt Beatty has not started. Well, in right and field. Re- Edwin Rios as well. <laughs> Jeez Louise. I mean, so it's like, you know, <laughs> there's only so much you can do and say. Yeah. And you know, it just feels like it's an honorary thing. Like they're trying to do right by Beatty, but it just doesn't make sense. I mean, I've gone over my scenario. Add a third catcher if that allows Will Smith to pinch hit. Another day where Austin Barnes started today and Will Smith did not come off the bench to pinch hit. Uh, it's just crazy to me. So just a quick Austin Barnes, Will Smith update, because I know the people probably want nothing to do with me giving these updates. Uh, Austin Barnes, 278 batting average. Sounds good, right? Well, 333 slugging percentage for our good friend Austin Barnes. 20 plate appearances, <laughs> six strikeouts. Will Smith, 28 plate appearances, 300 average, 464 on base, 750 slugging percentage, two home runs, just four strikeouts. So at least Will Smith has eight more plate appearances than Austin Barnes. Don't get me started on the fact that Austin Barnes DH'd a day and Will Smith did not. I mean, I just, I can't handle it. So there you go. I don't know what the stock up, stock down is in there, but Dave Roberts, Austin Barnes, Will Smith, some combination. I'll let you plug those one in there. So, well. Well, one thing I one thing I will say is that I thought it was good at least that we saw um, Will Smith caught Walker Bueller the other day. Um, so I guess the whole Austin Barnes personal catcher thing is Just it's Kershaw. it's only Kershaw, I guess. Like he's you know Will Smith is catching Walker Bueller and Bueller now, which is at least a good sign. And Smith has <laughs> been great defensively. Like I think I mean I don't yeah. know the defensive metrics. Throughout a couple runners, throughout a couple day, guys though. in the same game, yeah. his pitch framing has been good. I thought like he's made some great stops behind the plate. Obviously he had you know, one attempted tag where he couldn't catch the ball, the Osmani Grandal thing. I don't think he was going to tag that. I think it was one of those, like, you just move the glove at the speed you need to tag the guy, and if you don't catch it, then you don't catch it. Um, Mm -hmm. But I just, that's something to monitor. Will Smith has been very good defensively so far, and so if that continues, uh, that's kind of the only thing Austin Barnes has going for him is the defense pitch calling, that kind of thing. But, um, yeah, Will Smith uh, has been good. So let's go to big deal, no deal. And uh, there's a handful of things, some fun, some not so fun. We'll start with the not so fun stuff. Injuries. Cody Bellinger to the injured list. Tony Gonsolin to the injured list. Mookie Betts has missed a handful of games. These are the updates we've heard so far. Mookie Betts woke up with back stiffness on Wednesday, has not played since. Um, They're going to evaluate him on Tuesday. Not expected to go on the injured list. They're hoping he can return Tuesday. Cody Bellinger, no stress fractures, just soreness. Could be activated as early as Friday, which, oh, by the way, happens to be the opening of the Padres series. So that would be nice to get back there. And then Tony Gonsolin, right shoulder inflammation, quote, ways away from returning to the mound. I'll throw in Bruce Dark Gratterall. Has done some simulated stuff, but it does sound like he's two, maybe three or four weeks away from returning himself. So in that group, What's a big deal to you? What's no deal to you? And and what doesn't matter? Yeah, I'll say that uh, Bellinger and Betts, to me, that's both no deal. Those are minor injuries. Um, and, and this team has <laughs> enough depth as as yeah. we've seen to get by without those guys. So I don't think that's a huge deal. They'll both probably be back within the next couple of days, probably by Friday for that Padre series, like you mentioned. Um, I'd say Tony Gonsolin, that's kind of a big deal. Yeah. Um you know, shoulder injuries, that's never something you want to see. And and the fact that they're already saying it's going to be a while means, you know, um, that it's actually, you know, kind of serious. I'm not saying season ending serious, but, you know, it's like they said, it's going to be a while, yeah. maybe, you know, a month or two before we see him. Um, whenever he's able to start throwing again, he's going to have to ramp back up. Um, I'm sure they're going to want to build him up at least, you know, maybe not as a full starter, but at least to get to like three or four innings or whatever. Um, so maybe a while before we see him. Um 
but yeah, and, and Bruce Dargrado should be back soon. I'm excited for that. Um, that's just yet another, uh, you know, high leverage reliever to add to that bullpen. Maybe, you know, work his way into the closure mix. Similar with him as Dustin May, something, yeah. you know, we're going to be looking for just because we haven't seen him pitch at all this you know this yeah. year is we're gonna you know can he get more more swings and misses you know he's i bet if you looked up the reliever you know swing and miss rate he was probably right right near the bottom similar to dustin may so that's something we want to see with him if he wants to develop into you know the closer to the future yeah. he's gonna have to miss more bats yeah i'm with you the gonsolin one's obviously the big deal you never want to hear elbow or shoulder when you're talking about your pitcher uh, right shoulder inflammation is not good so far. It's not like worst case scenario. They haven't sort of diagnosed it with something major. Maybe it is just swelling and it goes yeah. down. Um, but that one's genuinely worrisome. Again, I think the Dodgers are fortunate because of the way Dustin May has pitched and their, their starting five has all kind of stayed healthy so far. Um, but Gonsolin was expected to be a really, really good six starter. And again, time needed for Nelson and price. But at the same time, if the Dodgers needed a six starter right now, uh, Dennis Santana, yeah. you know, I don't know, Mitch White. Like, I, I don't know who that sixth starter yeah. would be based on how Nelson yeah. and Price have looked. So that one's a big deal. And again, the fact that Mookie Betts isn't on the IL, no big deal there. You never like back stiffness. That kind of worries me. That feels like an old guy injury, but, um, you know, so be it. Cody Bellinger, it sounded like he just got cleated. So um, bummer that he just he got cleated. Yeah. Bummer that he did have to go on the IL, but, uh, but you know, so be it. So let's go to the next one. You kind of hinted at it. Trevor Bauer. Maybe, maybe not being under investigation for sticky stuff. Ken Rosenthal wrote an article for The Athletic, if this is new, pointing out that a couple of the baseballs Bauer had thrown the other night um, were sent to Major League headquarters to be investigated. There was a ton of controversy and confusion, I guess, because a lot of people responded with they're doing this in every stadium to a bunch of different pitchers. And the fact that the article was only written about Bauer seemed misleading. Other people suggesting Rosenthal seemed to be suggesting that Bauer was uniquely being investigated for this. Um, as some backstory to all of this, Major League Baseball has said they are going to um, crack down on pitching substances that pitchers use, which is ironic because they've just ignored it for a couple of years. Bauer was actually one of the guys a few years ago getting out in front and saying, this is ridiculous, calling out the Astros like, hmm, how did all these guys ramp up their rotations per minute all of a sudden miraculously? Yeah. Justin Verlander had a career resurgence. How did that happen? Baseball did nothing about it. Bauer basically openly admitting that he's doing it now, you know, without saying it out loud, but he's like, hmm, look at my rotation rates going way up, you know? So it's clear that this is being used. It's clear Bauer is one of a thousand pitchers in baseball that are using something. Big deal or no deal that this Ken Rosenthal piece comes out that maybe Bauer is being targeted. You know, I, I don't know if it's yeah. a big deal or no yeah. deal because I don't know what MLB's intentions are. Like, are they just going to, if they find stuff, are they just going to give him a warning? Like, are they going to suspend him right away and make an example of him? Like, I don't know. I'm curious to see. Yeah. But I just think this whole thing's ridiculous. Like, there's articles out there. I actually, just the other day, I read one. I think it was from like a year ago. It was Eno Saris. And there's quotes in there from different guys saying basically every pitcher uses a foreign substance. Like, I think it was a quote that said like 99.9% yeah. Of pitchers use something at least. So to single out Bauer, who, like like you mentioned, he was the one guy a couple years ago who said, "Hey, MLB, like this is happening," and they just completely yeah. ignored him. So I mean, why would when he tried to, you know, let MLB know that it was happening and they did nothing? Why would he not join in on it too when he's seeing so many other pitchers, you know, have success with it, um, specifically the Astros? So yeah, I, I think it's ridiculous. I'm hoping that it's just a case of. Um, you know, they're they're taking, you know, not every pitcher's balls, but they're, they're testing out a bunch of samples from different guys. Yeah. And, and and ultimately, maybe if they find something, they get a warning or something. And then if they find something again, then it's a suspension. But I think it would be absolutely ridiculous if they just suspend Bauer out of nowhere. Um, so I guess we'll see, you know, how it goes. Yeah, there was some stuff coming out that was basically like this is almost an unenforceable rule, because even if they found something on the baseball, they would have to have definitive proof that like right. video of Trevor Bauer putting that stuff on the baseball, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. So obviously some guys have gotten in trouble. Pineda, I believe, or maybe it was Severino, one of the guys on the Yankees, like it was like obvious, like he had something on his neck or yeah. his hat or whatever. Like as, as long as you avoid the obvious stuff, it feels like you're pretty safe. Some guys have it in their glove, I guess. But it, the vibe I got immediately afterward was like, this is much ado about nothing because there's nothing they can do. The flip side is there's a bunch of guys out there saying, you know, this is no different than steroid. Like this is like the pitching version of steroids of just performance enhancing by putting substances where you get better grip on the ball or you can spin the ball differently. So I'll be curious. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where 
I'm not saying like baseball shouldn't crack down on this stuff. Obviously, Bauer should not be singled out. This is widespread. But right. the other side of it is I don't know how they crack down on it because, again, just because you find something on a baseball doesn't mean it came from the pitcher. Maybe it's pine tar coming off of a bat. Maybe it's, you know, exactly. whatever. So we'll, we'll monitor it. Again, it does feel like Bauer clapped back immediately as everyone expected him to on Twitter. Of course. Um, yeah. But we'll see. <laughs> something to monitor there. Um, a couple more. One more sort of on the serious side of things. And then we've got some funny quotes, uh, big deal or no deal to you that the Dodgers are lining up Bueller, Kershaw and Bauer, uh, in some order for the series against the Padres, their first time pitching against the Padres, uh, this upcoming Friday, Saturday, Sunday, currently, um, although I guess currently they've got Urias pitching Friday. So, um, I, I, that's what, you know, the ESPN probables have Darvish and Snell no, Saturday. I think, Sunday. I think that's wrong. Okay. I think that's so wrong. Bueller, I think it's... Bueller will pitch Friday. Urias maybe Thursday. Um, Kershaw and uh, and Bauer on Saturday, Sunday. Th- that was what the quotes uh, were today. That the Dodgers were going to have. Oh, yeah. Right. It, it's it's Bauer Friday. I mean, Bueller Friday, Kershaw Saturday, Bauer Sunday is what it'll be. And like I said, Darvish and Snell at least Saturday, Sunday for the Padres. Big deal or no deal to you that the Dodgers tinker with their rotation a little bit, move some guys around for a three game series against the Padres. Yeah, I think it's kind of a big deal. You know, it's a, it's the first series against the team that that you know is coming for you. Um, so yeah, I think it's a big deal. Dave Roberts even said like you could look into it, you know, however you want, yeah. like basically hinting that they did it by design. Um, but yeah, I think it's really cool. I'm I'm looking forward to that series. Like you also mentioned, the Padres will have you know their top guys going. Um, there's an outside chance that they're they haven't announced their Friday starter. There's an outside chance that could be Denelson Lamette, who would be. Their, their third guy who hasn't pitched yet this season. So, yeah, that'll be a fun series. Um, obviously, I don't think the results of that series mean a whole lot. Yeah. Like, it, we're still in April here. <laughs> like, the season just started. October is a long time away. But you definitely want to want to come out and show, you know, hey, this this division's still ours. You know, we know you guys made some sexy moves. You know, we know you guys got some talent on your roster. But the division still goes through L.A. You know, we're the defending yeah. champs. We got three aces, and we're going to throw them all out right at you. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, I mean, and these two games, these games do count essentially double, right? Because it is a win for you and a loss for them. And so I think it makes total sense where if you have this freedom to move guys around an extra day or no extra day, absolutely, you should have your three best starting pitchers going against the chief competition that you know you're going to have. You know, um, the Rockies, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, that's fine. Like, get whoever can pitch those games. The Rockies (laughs) aren't any good. So I think it's a big deal. I think it's fun. Um, I will throw one plug out there for those watching. We're going to try a new segment starting this week. I've got a friend of mine who hasn't come on before who's kind of into the betting side of baseball. And so we're going to start a new series that's going to come out either on Thursday afternoon or Friday morning, previewing the weekend series from a gambling perspective. So what are the matchups? What are the lines, totals, etc.? So get excited for that. I think it's going to be fun. Uh, we'll see. But it is awesome that our first series we're going to break down on that front is the Dodgers and the Padres and all the best starters. So yeah. that'll be a good one there. Um, a couple other funny ones. You tell me big deal or no deal. Um, this is a quote from Clayton Kershaw, also Dave Roberts, also Ned Coletti. Zach McKinstry is a baseball player. Uh, big deal or no deal to you that that all three of those guys can have confirmed that Zach McKinstry is a baseball player? Uh, yeah, that's huge. I, I thought he was a soccer player this whole time. So just knowing that he actually does, in yeah. fact, play baseball, that's huge. <laughs> no, no. But in reality, I feel like people like like to laugh when like baseball players say like this guy's a baseball player. But I think like when you're in the game, like, you know what that means, right? Yeah. Like he does all the dirty work like he, you know, he's sliding in the bases. He's taking extra bases, making diving plays like I don't know. I, I understand what they mean when they say he's a baseball player, but it, it's still pretty funny. <laughs> OK, similar. Edwin Rios. Not today. This was Kershaw's last start. Quote. Clayton Kershaw was Clayton Kershaw tonight. Big deal or no deal to you that the other night Clayton Kershaw was Clayton Kershaw? Yeah, this is, again, this is a super big deal here. You know, I was under the impression that he was Clay Aiken this whole time. You know, he's singing up there. But, um, you know, the fact that he's Clayton Kershaw, that's huge. Yeah. You know, that Clayton Kershaw's the best pitcher of his generation, one of the greatest of all time. So the Dodgers still have that guy yeah. in case anyone Huge, <laughs> huge that they found him this year. So good news yeah. there from Edwin Rios. Yeah, during the, we didn't really see him much during the spring, to be honest. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, it's good that they finally found him. Will Smith no longer walking up to Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Big deal or no deal to you, Daniel? I was a little disappointed in this, to be honest. Um, you know, I was a fan of his new walk-up song. It was a Drake song. I, I, I'm a big Drake fan. But with that being said, I feel like that was kind of his thing. You know, yeah. he's Will Smith. 
Fresh Prince of Bel Air, or I mean, if you're gonna s- switch it, go. You know, there's plenty of right. other you know Will Smith songs to go with. The the guy was you know before he 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 became a famous actor, he's a big time rapper. So I feel like there's plenty of options out there. Get jiggy with it. Um, switched, which um, which I think would have been perfect. But yeah, I mean, it, it is what it is. I don't look. I don't care about walk ups all that much. <laughs> but um, but <laughs> how how much we hear that walk up is more important to me because that means yeah. he's in the lineup and playing more. Okay, two more here. <laughs> Julio Urias said that the Dodgers World Series ring is quote very big and heavy. Big deal or no deal to you that the Dodgers World Series ring is quote very big and heavy. Yeah, I mean, I, I saw that through the TV screen, so he didn't have to say that for me to know it. Anyone who sees those things can see how, how much they pop. Um, and again, I said it before, but credit to the Dodgers. Everything about that ring ceremony was just awesome. Um, you know, it was emotional. It was funny. Um, you know, so I, it, it had everything. You know, I, we'll get into, you know, the introductions with the favorite players. I thought that was just a really cool idea. Yeah. Um, we got, you know, Chipper Jones is introducing Matt Beatty. I, it's something not, I was not so expecting random. going into the day. Um, but yeah, that was, that was fun. The rings are awesome. Okay. Last one here, Daniel, big deal or no deal. Your fantasy team losing eight to four this week, big deal or no deal there for trust the process. Hey, Hey, we, we got, um, we got, we're, you know, we're the walking wounded squad right now. I got a bunch of guys on the injured list with that being said though, we're getting healthy. I'm still high on the squad long term. Um, it's just going to take us a few weeks to get going. Um, I was, it was a six, five matchup going into today. So a, ba- a bad Sunday kind of ruined the week for me, which is unfortunate, but we, we still like the squad we got. Um, we got all, all my Dodgers are doing well, you know, it's Corey true. Seager's doing his thing. Justin Turner's mashing. Trevor Bauer shoved, Dustin, Dustin May. May shoved, Julio Urias has had two good starts. So my Dodgers are, are doing well for me. I just need the rest of the guys to, you know, get healthy. Fair. 6-6 six, six tie for me this week. So uh, we'll take go. it. We'll take it. First week, not, not <laughs> under the 500 line. Well, you hinted at this. We'll end with this. The, uh, the intro video. So for those that missed it, you should definitely go back and check the ring ceremony. I know I couldn't watch it live, but I was able to catch it that night on YouTube. Um Basically, what they did is before each player, they had asked them kind of who is your favorite player growing up, that type of thing. And then they went out and found all of those people and had them record messages to send in. And so I thought it was funny after as I was watching it, I was texting with my dad, my brother, my cousin. And I'm like, oh, that video is awesome. That video is hilarious. That video is stupid. And so I decided to do a uh, a rankings of video. So the number one video for me of all the intro videos was Ichiro. Ichiro, I believe, to Edwin Rios. Was that correct? Yeah. And Another just super random one. <laughs> super random. Not sure the connection. But Ichiro speaking in Spanish. So shout out to Ichiro for, yeah. for being like trilingual at least. I'm guessing it's probably at least four. But speaking in Spanish. Yeah. And it was funny basically saying, hey, I played all these years. Where's my ring? You should give me a ring. So I've got the Ichiro <laughs> video number one on my rankings. Any issues with you there? Well, well, I got to wait and see how the Fair. rest of this list goes, because I feel like with the Bronson or Royal thing, he either has to be first or last. Okay. Like, he can't be anywhere in between. He's not first so. or last on my list, so we'll get to that <laughs> one here in a moment. Second for me was Ken Griffey Jr. giving a video to Joe Kelly. So first of all, it's Ken Griffey Jr. who's awesome, universally beloved yeah. by baseball fans, even if he did fall asleep in the dugout with his, in his swan song season. Great story. But not only did he record a video, he gave the Joe Kelly pouty face on behalf of Joe Kelly. So that was a close one, but I've got Griffey number two on my list. Your thoughts on Ken Griffey recording a video for Joe Kelly. Yeah, I, I think the pouty face put him at number one for me okay. and mix, yeah. mixed with the fact that he's Ken Griffey Jr., who is one of my all-time favorite players. So yeah, I, I probably would have had him at one, okay. but each row was also hilarious. So number three might might surprise some people. I've got John Smoltz number three on my list, but the, the reasoning behind this is very important. The fact that we all got to watch John Smoltz have to record a video congratulating the Dodgers made it so beautiful. We all had to listen to the guy for however many weeks it felt like we had to listen to, especially against the Braves. He was insufferable. He was brutal. And then for him to come back and record a video congratulating the Dodgers, there was a special ounce of joy for me. So I've got John Smoltz congratulating the Dodgers is number three on my list. That's fair. I, he probably wouldn't crack my list, but I understand why you have him there. And I honestly, I was a little surprised he didn't get – um, any booze <laughs> yeah. really like a rod a rod got booed you know super loud so i was surprised that smoltz didn't hear it from from the daughter stadium faithful so i've got bronson arroyo fourth on my list and and basically just the full send bronson arroyo was was major respect in my book uh if you haven't seen it it is the weirdest thing you will ever <laughs> see uh if you told me bronson arroyo was incredibly high i would believe you when he recorded this 
Uh, not a bad singer. Love Wonderwall. So shout out to Bronson Arroyo there. Um, I understand the it should be first or last, nothing in between. He finds himself nicely on fourth on my list. It was enjoyable for the weirdness, and so he makes number four on my list. Do you have? Would you have him first yeah, or last? Was, Just out of curiosity. I, honestly, I would have had him first. Okay. I thought it was hilarious. Like I, I like different. Like I don't. <laughs> you got it. Like there were so many of those that like were pretty boring. Like to be honest. Yeah. Like so, I, I liked. He did something different. Um, I didn't understand the song choice there. Like maybe I could. That's my Simon Cowell coming out. Like I thought he could have had a little better song choice. Um, but with that being said, I thought it was hilarious. And also, I'm just kind of curious, like. Why was Bronson Arroyo Walker Bueller's favorite baseball player growing up? So I like, think, that's he, grew up. I think he was a Reds fan growing up. And I guess if he oh, okay. timed it right, Arroyo was probably the best pitcher that the Reds had. That's, and then also fair. they crossed paths on the Dodgers. Arroyo was ten- temporarily on the Dodgers as part of uh, the Matt Kemp trade, I believe, to Cincinnati. Mm-hmm. And Bueller and Arroyo were both like rehabbing simultaneously at the same place. So they, they had a personal relationship after Bueller had known him. That's the limited understanding I've got. I did get lots of okay. text messages from people like, what the heck? Why is Bronson Arroyo <laughs> on there? And so I did a little digging. I think there was an article, it might be on The Athletic, uh, that kind of broke down a little bit of the backstory there. So uh, gotcha. good stuff. Okay. There. Yeah, no, I'll, have to go re- yeah. I'll have to go read that. No. But yeah, that, that was great. I thought that was great. And I loved how he just ended it by saying, I love you. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, we need more love going around these days. So I like that. Number five on my <laughs> list is David Ortiz. Uh, he was the very last Julio Urias was, was his. So when another one of these weird pitcher hitter combos, Urias used to be a first baseman. I think he even said specifically, he loved the fact that Poppy was a big guy because Urias was a little rounder. So that's number five. But part of the reason he makes the list is because at the end, he calls out Mookie Betts for not selecting him. He's like, Hey Mookie, why am I not making this video for you? So Ortiz is number five. I'll throw out number six. This is as far as my list goes until we get to last place. Gary Sheffield gets number six just because Gary Sheffield's a freaking man. Love Gary Sheffield. So I've got Ortiz five and Sheffield six on my list. Yeah, I probably would have had Ortiz a little higher. I I think he's so funny. Like he's one of just the most naturally funny people. I thought it was hilarious how he called out Mookie uh, for, for not being his. That was a little interesting. Mookie had Jimmy Rollins, which I thought was pretty random. Um, yeah. But yeah, I I thought David Ortiz was hilarious. Um, One guy you didn't mention who I would have had on my list was Chase Utley. Um, Not even, he didn't even say anything special, but he's just Chase Utley. Like, that's the man. Like, anytime I could see Chase Utley's face, um, I'm I'm very happy about that. So he's the only one, other one that really stood out. Um, I'm trying to think, like, if there are any other, you know, funny ones. Because I I really like the funny ones, but I think you touched on them with, you know, Ortiz and Ichiro and Ken Griffey and those guys. Yeah, last place for me is A-Rod. And it was like, he's not even last place. He was unranked. Um, (laughs) Disappointing. I'm trying to remember whose video he recorded. Um, I can't remember. But, I mean, the point is, like, why is A-Rod? Nobody, no, like, who, (laughs) I don't understand who is, like, who likes Alex Rodriguez. Um, so he's yeah. last. I mean, one other one, like I thought the Fred McGriff one was random. Like it, it appeared obvious to me that they just cut McGriff's video. Cause I think he talked for like four and a half minutes long. Uh, <laughs> I think they just, it looked like he was not done speaking yet. So that was just a random, like boring one to me. I mean, McGriff, former Dodger shout out to him, but, um, yeah, I'm trying. Those were the memorable ones to me. A-Rod is the only negative one that I'm going to go with on my list though. Anybody that yeah, I'm missing I, I, on your end. No, I, I was just going to say, I thought it was hilarious how loudly A-Rod got booed. Um, there's really no, like, super crazy reason that Dodger fans should hate A-Rod. Like, it wasn't like he played against them in a World Series or anything like that. I, I just think Dodger fans think he's annoying. Like, yeah. we got to listen. Dodgers are on Sunday Night Baseball a lot. We got to listen to him on that broadcast a lot. So I think it was just a case of we don't really like this guy. Um and they let him hear it, which I thought was hilarious. And also, the mayor of L.A., Eric Garcetti, who was raising uh, the championship flag, they also let him hear it, which I thought yeah. was hilarious. He kind of smiled a little bit. Um, but yeah, overall, just a really great ceremony. Dustin May. Dustin May was who Alex Rodriguez, which I guess makes sense. May's a Texas guy, A-Rod with the Rangers. Uh, Kyle Seeger, Corey Seeger was another good one that probably could have could have gotten yeah. a shout out. Um, yeah, Kyle, Kyle saying he was jealous. I thought that was funny. Yeah, there, <laughs> Kyle was like rumored to be coming to the Dodgers. It felt like forever. I think he's over the hill in Wash now where he wouldn't he wouldn't scratch the uh, scratch the lineup here. But um, overall, like you said, it was a great, sir. Great deal 
45 minutes. Felt bad for Walker Bueller as the pitcher. He didn't get to enjoy any of it. Um, but he pitched mm-hmm. all right and, and obviously gets to keep the ring as well. So fun stuff. If you haven't seen it, it's definitely worth checking out. So that'll do it for us tonight. Uh, obviously, this will uh, the Dodgers 8-2 and two on the season, which is great. Uh, apologies. Last week, I, I we were supposed to do a live show after the home opener. One of my daughters had like a dental emergency we had to take care of. Everything turned out to be okay. It was just one of those Friday deals, day game. We needed to get to a dentist, and the only appointment they had was, you know, right at post game, 415. So apologies to that. We are going to go live Friday night after the Friday night game between the Dodgers and Padres, which, as we pointed out, should be a really, really good one. Uh, that's a 7-10 start. Dodgers at Padres, we believe Clayton Kershaw is going to be the star, or excuse me, Walker Bueller is going to Walker be the starter. Bueller, yeah. TBD for the Padres, p- potentially Denelson Lamette. So check that out. That'll be Daniel and I live post game on Friday night. Uh, Thursday, we're going to have a sort of a weekend preview with uh, a buddy of mine named Rob doing some betting line stuff. And then check out throughout the week. Make sure you've subscribed here because we've got a lot of short videos uh, throughout the week reacting to day to day stuff. So DodgerBlue.com for all your latest stuff. DodgerBlue1958 everywhere on social media. That's Daniel Stark, and I'm Jeff Spiegel. Our Twitter handles are below. This is the home of the 2020 World Series champions. And in honor of that, we've got the same Vin Scully quote, but we've got a video to accompany with it. So we appreciate you watching. watching. Uh, We hope you enjoyed the show, and we will see you next time. The best team holding a trophy high in the air. The Los Angeles Dodgers, champions of the baseball.